Alexander Grebe, my German friend, Head of Developer Experience at Hypertrack. Welcome on stage. Hello, guys. Can you hear me? All right, wonderful. <laughs> thank you for welcoming stage me. Stage is yours. Yes, thank you. I have a wonderful menu for you guys. Thanks very much for joining me. Uh, we're making a bit of fun uh, about the show that will happen later, so you can enjoy that as a sneak peek to what you will see later on. Um, today, I'll be talking about managing multiple API stacks on serverless. Uh, just a bit about myself, just very quickly. Um, I graduated in computer science degree, worked as a software engineer for multiple companies, later on moved on to advocate for open source at SAP, and then I led developer relations at Uber, uh, after which I founded the company as a CTO. Failed horribly after a year, but it was an interesting experience, so I earned my badge, and then uh, I joined Hypertrack just a couple of months ago. And at Hypertrack, we have something amazing cooked up for you. So uh, we develop everything on serverless, and we had the pleasure of developing uh, the architecture from scratch. So I will be talking about how we manage different API stacks uh, on serverless and what kind of takeaways we got from that. So what is Hypertrack? Um, the platform that we built is there to track the movement of your business. Uh, as you can see over here on the screen, there's a small animation that shows a few that we have provided. And if you track something that's uh, moving and you're really trying to achieve business value with it, uh, what you want to do most often is you want to see a, a dot on the map at the very least. But then as well, you want to make sure that you get notifications if somebody's close to like a destination. You also want to have webhooks uh, for specific things like uh, geofencing. So if you're close to some kind of place, you probably want to know about that too. And we build a platform that makes it super easy for developers to enjoy all of that. Uh, so we empower developers through a couple of different interfaces that we have. It's APIs, RESTful APIs, we have GraphQL, we have uh, webhooks, uh, we have views, uh, SDKs. A lot of different interfaces, and you can imagine there's a bunch of complexity that comes along with it. Uh, so as I already mentioned, um, we are looking at location services. So what we did for a long time is really trying to figure out how the sensory data works natively. What kind of signals are you getting on the devices? Right now it's iOS and Android, uh, and they have different formats, they're sending at different times, there's so many different things that you have to consider. Uh, location management seem, uh, might seem very easy in the beginning, but you will quickly realize there's a huge complexity that comes with it. So we did that so that you can do this. You can basically just join, <laughs> and you can use our webhooks, you can use our developer APIs, and you can really avoid all the complexity that comes with it. You can make it super easy for yourself to deal with it. And um, as I already mentioned, we have this beautiful architecture that we had the pleasure to of building out from scratch on serverless. We had a bunch of requirements that uh, prompted us to decide to go with serverless. Uh, some of them were the fact that we need to be very much um, responsive to the workload that is happening on the server side. So there's never a chance for us to figure out how many devices will be tracked. There's never a chance for us to figure out how many people are actually actively looking at the location data. Plus, there are all kinds of complexities that come with uh, mobile SDKs. So if you actually lose um, location service, uh, if you actually lose data services on your phone, your location would still be tracked. And then if you come back a couple of seconds later, maybe it will be sent in the batch. So all of a sudden, there's like a huge workload. And we want to be super flexible. We wanted to scale up and down without really even thinking about it which reasoned us to decide to go with serverless. So this is a very, very simplistic uh, uh, presentation of our architecture. Uh, we have a blog that just ran it last week on Hacker News that explains all things in detail. Uh, you can look at that later if you wanted to. But let me just quickly guide you through the architecture. And then you will see a bunch of complexities that arise with it. And I want to talk, that's the core of my presentation today. I want to talk about how we deal with those complexities and how we really make it work. And I want you to learn from that. So in the beginning, we have um, mobile SDKs. So uh, we have devices like Android and iOS. They would in a SDK, in, in install an SDK within your native application, and then it would send data. So it generates data based on the sensory um, uh, information you have on the phone, and then it goes to an API gateway that we have. Um, we, apparently, we already talked a lot about API gateways today, so I'm not going to talk about that as much. But as you can imagine, we're actually filtering out, making sure that the data we're receiving post the API gateway is really correct. So a bunch of things are triggered here, like authentication. We have a Lambda that would figure out if the authentication header that you provided to us is actually accurate and you are allowed to send data. Uh, there's rate limiting included that we also account for and a bunch of different other things. 
So as soon as the data passed that uh, API gateway, it actually goes to a um, Kinesis Firehose over here. You can see the second one. Uh, it's a different icon that usually Amazon icon has, but what happens there is uh, we identified that we need to have a super strong and very reliable architecture that would never lose any single location information. So there's no way for us that, you know, during processing time something breaks down and uh, NSDK or users not allowed to send any location information. That will be really bad on us. What we do here is we actually decouple the front end and the API endpoints from the processing. So with Kinesis, we put everything in the stream, it will be stored there, and then we have uh, actually something that will be triggered, which is Lambda, to uh, collect the data and then really process and continue with it. Which means we can store location data up to 24 hours at the very least, and you can tweak that, um, in order for it to even be picked up. So it can be there for 24 hours before any other services picks it up. And the second, the stream consumer is actually the one that's being triggered and then picks up the data in order to consume it further. So what we do in the beginning is we store that data. We actually have DynamoDB in order to store the data over here in the raw data format, and then later on we process it. So there are a bunch of different activities that come along with uh, processing of location data. There's a lot of smartness you can employ. Uh, of course, you want to remove outliers. Uh, you should probably not travel with the, sp the speed of flight if you're moving with the device. Uh, you can predict how far somebody can move along from one signal to the other. Uh, you can also think about uh, snapping to road features. If you have just GPS right now, if you would look at my signal, it would probably be completely off, but you can have a chance to snap to the next or to close to the closest road. And all these kind of features are uh, part of data cl cleansing. So we have a data cleanser lambda that really does the whole, the whole um, processing there. And then it goes into the process data store. Um, from there, this is the interesting part. So here's where, where it really gets more complicated. Uh, from there, we have two different things. Uh, one side, we export data. On the other side, we actually have a bunch of services that consume the data. So let me talk about the data export first. Um, data export, you can see on the bottom here, essentially an S3 bucket that I wanted to put on represent here. What happens is that we can export the data and some clients actually want to have the raw data or the process data. But also really cool is that we use uh, uh, AWS Athena which is uh, Presto, um, just managed on AWS and allows us to have a query engine on the data that we export, which is super efficient because we, we don't have to have a database for that, we just have some files and we can query those files, which is really cool. Now, the other interesting part, um, that's where it becomes really interesting, is uh, services. So, as you can imagine, depending on the location data you get, a bunch of different things should happen. Um, location data can be separated out into just pure latitude, longitude, whatever you have. It can also be health data of your, of your device. Uh, if your battery is running low, maybe somebody deactivated location services at all, maybe there's some kind of a, a problem on the software side or hardware side. So there are a bunch of different activities that we can get and then we can process. Uh, one of the most basic one is of course location for uh, the device, latitude, longitude. So if you receive that kind of information, it would kick off and trigger the device's service. Uh, the device's service would process the data, update devices uh, on our end. Uh, it goes into an uh, Amazon um, R RDS, and then from there it can be exposed to different endpoints. Next to that, we also have trips. And what I really wanted to paint in this picture is, uh, as you can see, trips has a different database, and you can see summaries actually doesn't even have a database associated with it, which means that uh, it's. The, the, the bucket I have here is an abstraction layer to really what is there. There's a bit more complexity, but I, won't, I don't want to talk about all of these pieces here in my talk. So, uh, as soon as the data is processed and the service did its thing, uh, it goes to interfaces. As I already said, we have a bunch of different interfaces we consume and use. Uh, we have a REST API that's publicly available. We have webhooks publicly available too. Uh, we have GraphQL that's currently private. Uh, GraphQL has also subscription services, um, which you, you kind of need to understand if you're dealing with webhooks, it's kind of a similar concept of push versus pull. Uh, then on top of that, we layer it with our own SDKs to make things very easy. Uh, we have our own queues in the dashboard. But you can also see how our third-party developers actually use that in order to build either mobile apps, na native apps, or web applications, or even use it just to train their algorithm to figure out how to optimize routing for a bunch of different things they need to do throughout the day as a worker. So all of these things are coming into place as soon as you consider the consumer side, 
And that's where really the complexity comes into play. And that's what I want to talk about today. So, learnings. Um, first, architecture. Second, I will talk about the software development process and what we learned there. And third, I will talk about the developer experiences. Uh, the first key takeaway is that you should really layer your data processing and interfaces. By that I mean, whenever you have data processing in place, you should completely disassociate it from how you want to expose your data in one of the interfaces. Uh, if you're dealing with GraphQL, REST, webhooks, uh, all of these sweet technologies that somehow expose your data, you will realize that there's a bunch of different notions to how the data should look like, how data is transformed, how it's transition, what kind of formats are really supported. Um, you should not have that imply um, as to what you should be doing on the processing side. So completely this is where you should associate this part. If you look into uh, the architecture that I just presented, we have uh, the processing stage that actually has multiple layers. So we have the raw data on the device, the data that we actually receive, then there's a processing stage, and there's a second processing stage. And then we actually uh, change and transform the data on the edges at the interface to make sure that the data format at the edges is what people are really looking for. And that's very important because you actually need to be able to go back and in turn have a kind of a flexibility with your interfaces, uh, with your data and your processing models as opposed to just what you expose. Uh, next thing, kind of kind of evident, I guess, for, for people who are using um, different cloud providers. Uh, you want to careful, carefully evaluate the specifics and limitations of the technologies you're using. Um, we, for instance, have had this great example of um, AWS um, AppSync, which is the on-demand solution for GraphQL on AWS. So GraphSync, uh, go, sorry, AppSync actually has amazing features, comes in very easily. You can just uh, spin it up. It connects with internal services, has a bunch of connections that you can leverage and use. Uh, but the interesting part is that at some point we wanted to adopt a standard for location format, which is called GeoJSON. And GeoJSON means I have to present the location data in a specific format. So we wanted to implement that in our GraphQL interface, but quickly realized it's going to be more challenging than it should be. Uh, turns out uh, you cannot really use uh, custom scalar types in AppSync, but you can use it generally in GraphQL. So the deployment on AWS had limitations that we didn't really think through in the beginning or didn't really see coming at us. Um, this is just one small example, but another complexity that arises, of course, is this deep learning curve. As soon as you integrate with one cloud provider, they will make it super easy for you to spin up more and more services. So easy to add on top of it. But then, of course, there's, a, there's like a learning curve that you have to go through. And every developer needs to go through that learning curve. So you need to really understand the entire technology stack, which ma makes it really, really hard to deal with. Uh, and there are a bunch of other things, like um, kicking off Lambda functions as soon as you have something that um, happens in AppSync, uh, has some slight delays, as you can imagine. So there are a couple of things that you have to think through before you really go with one cloud provider. Um, the development. So, this is very, very important and dear to my heart. Um, if you have a bunch of different API interfaces, whatever it might be, uh, you should really strive for consistent versioning, but be independent of the actual interface. Now, what I mean by that is, as you see in this image, there is a ship. Uh, there's a shipment, and there are different containers on it. The containers all have uh, the very same format, so it's very, very consistent. However, as you can see on the shadows, the lines are very different. And I take this as the versions of different API interfaces. So uh, different API interfaces will always reason you to bump up versions just for specific things that need to happen in that one interface. And you should not strive for, let's say, a version 5, and you want to have everywhere version 5 applied just for the reason of that version, having in that version. Always be very, very thoughtful about it and adopt consistency. Um, there's a framework that we use internally, and I think it's widely adopted too, uh, semantic versioning. Um, really helps you to understand when to do what and what kind of version bump you should go for, a minor or a major bump. And uh, one thing that I really like about this picture, which is kind of by accident too, is there's this one really long line, this, this big shadow on the, on the right side. Um, what's important here is you should try to have feature parity across your interfaces. 
So I take this one shadow as an example of uh, you adding one feature to one specific interface that might not be available in other interfaces. Uh, what that means is you're actually reasoning the developer to make choices for that feature, but neglecting the fact that there's an interface they might need to, uh, to implement. Maybe they won't like it, but you actually want them to go for it just because you don't have feature parity. So you're kind of steering them in that direction even though they don't really want to use it. And I'll explain a bit later why you need to give them the flexibility of having different uh, interfaces. Cool. So this is also very, very important. Um, you should, uh, you know, this image is kind of funny because I, I just randomly found this and I think it's a perfect fit. You should always try to align uh, private and public interfaces on the conceptual level. What I mean by that is that if your internal developers have a mental model of something, how something works, how pro procedures work, how the data structure looks like, but you're exposing entirely different concepts uh, on the external interfaces, it's gonna be really hard to merge those two if you actually need it. But the other, end, the other thing is your developers will not be able to think like a third party developer. They will not understand what kind of challenges your external developers are going through. They will not be able to even uh, go on that level, they will, they will just see there's a huge disconnect. Um, and this is a great example. So if you're asking somebody external to use the REST API, that will be basically the bridge that they're building, but you internally just use GraphQL, you're building the tunnel, it, it will never actually converge. So your developers either need to figure out how the REST API works and get some kind of an empathy implemented themselves, or you conceptually align them very early on to make sure that it's gonna be a bit easier for you to get to that mental state that also external developers have. I would assume that many of you know um, this image here. It's the concept of Hyperloop, uh, put forward by Elon Musk. Uh, the interesting thing here is that he started talking about this concept during an interview. So it was basically just a concept he verbally manifested, went out to the world, people give a bunch of feedback, like this, like that, uh, suggested improvements, ideas, thoughts, they built on top of that idea. And um, it effectively what was happening is there was a lot of feedback happening, a lot of conversations happening about what could really work, what the best case scenario would be, what maybe should be avoided, even though there was never a single product. There was never something built. It was just a concept in his mind that he wanted to really put forward. And the great thing about that is he collected, or collectively, uh, we collected a lot of feedback around that technology, around that product that could look like. So that Hyperloop one could start and basically piggyback on what's already created. Um, the great thing is if you translate that into API development or interface development, um, you should talk to your early users very early in the process. So if you have a stage of conceptualization or if you create specifications for your users, you want them to look at it very early on. You want them to feedback on it, they should interact with it, tell if it really fills their need Tell if they, if they really can use it for the purposes they're thinking about. Uh, you will often realize there's a slight mismatch, but you want to realize that rather earlier on before you actually go into production. So try to encourage people in an early stage, maybe like a beta version, to have feedback, uh, to feedback on your spec before you even go into uh, implementation stage. And this one is very interesting. So. Um, Throughout my career, I actually saw different engagement models and how APIs were developed. Um, one interesting thing was that most of the time you would conceptualize it as a team, you would figure out how it could look like, and then you kind of start implementation while you're also working on the spec at the same time. And as soon as you're done, you're just delivering it and you're saying, well, it's kind of shipped now to production, please use it. Um, when I joined Hypertrack, I realized that a different model works much, much better. Um, so this is more or less connected to the idea that I put forward before, but if you start conceptualizing and thinking about how you, should, um, how you should solve the problems that users have, what should really happen on a high level without thinking about the interface, that's very, very helpful. And then as the next stage, you can actually specify and define how this interface could look like. And that would be across different interfaces, but consistent across all of them. Now the interesting thing is you can actually use that and then put another layer on top of it, which is the documentation. And that's what we did with the last project too at Hypertrack. And we would uh, conceptualize it, we have a quick spec, and then that spec would turn into a document. Now that documentation, we in fact put public. We put it live, early adopters and early users could look at it, 
at the same time, our developers would actually start working on the services. Now, here's the cool thing. Two things happened. Um, our users would give us feedback as to what might be missing, as to how the concept aligns with their mental model of what they need to do. But the other great thing is developers would look at the external documentation, almost like a third-party developer, and trying to make sure that the documentation put forward will be what's gonna happen in the implementation. Now, there will be changes. It's an iterative process, but that reasons developers to actually update the documentation and have a shared ownership, which is amazing. So that was uh, a great concept, in fact. Turned out that went really well for us. And then later on, um, one thing that I really think is extremely important, if you implement it and you kind of finish the implementation, uh, you should not be done. You should actually only complete uh, as soon as you demonstrate it works. Now, there are a couple of different ways to demonstrate your API integration could work, your interfaces work as intended. Um, the one basic one that mostly is used internal is doc hooting, uh, try and create some sample apps and so on and so forth. Uh, the other thing is on more in the, like an external side where you can create sample apps, put them publicly, uh, publicly out there on GitHub as repos, and then people can clone them and start using them. But you wanna prove that it actually works just as you intended it to work. So three more things, and I'm running a bit late, so I'm just gonna speed up for the developer experience part. Um, this is very important to me, but I think it kinda goes without saying almost. You should respect existing guidelines for specific interfaces. All of them differ. They all have different name conventions. They all have different data structures. They all have different security mechanisms. I get that we want to make our life easier if we develop all of them, but it really is not the right thing to do. You should always adopt the best practice out there. Uh, the pun here is, by the way, camel case uh, versus snake case. That's why the camel thing is there. And one interesting aspect there is still, uh, you would never see that sign outside of the desert. So only specific to that area and very, very much tailored. So next thing, uh, adopt known standards where possible. Um, this is important too, especially when it comes to security. There are a bunch of people that created RFCs uh, they have verified that there's a security standard that will be met for sure, and you should always look out for these. So internally, we use GeoJSON, which, is a, which I already mentioned for location. We use OAuth. Uh, we have a bunch of other standards that we actually piggyback back on to make sure that developers can find libraries for their own program language and not really do it themselves, because there's so much adoption already out there for those standards. So if you know this RFC, talk to your neighbor and tell them what it is and what RFC this is. If you're really smart and a smarty pants, tell them what kind of flow that is of the RFC. Last thing, um, educate developers when to use what interface and how. If you have a bunch of different interfaces, it's really important to educate people how to use them. Uh, we have, so I, I just wanna give one example. We have webhooks and we have GraphQL subscriptions. Effectively, the same communication mode, it's a push notification. However, the fundamental change is GraphQL actually allows you not only server-to-server -server communication, but server-to-client communication. So it means for everybody who needs push notifications, they can skip the server side instead of going through webhooks and having server-to-server -server and then server-to-mobile phone communication. They can just go through, right through the mobile phone. And there are a bunch of different architecture trade-offs that you want to educate them on and make sure they're using the right interface. Uh, by the way, this image is an image of different connectors for EV uh, cars. I don't know why they're so terrified, but I guess because there's so many out there. Okay, why even bother though? Why would we create so many different interfaces? Why don't we just put out one out there? Why don't we just do a rest and let the people deal with it? I think the important takeaway here is that there's a lot of um, imperfection in technologies that we use nowadays. There are a lot of trade-offs and architecture difference and developers ultimately need to understand those and they will have different needs and they will actually have a need for flexibility and using different interfaces. Now, very brief, this image shows you right away. GraphQL, fancy, three-layered approach to the swing. REST API is just one, but actually not even really working. Think of it as state stateful application to HTTP, which is by default stateless. It's kind of a, a weird thing to do stuff. Webhooks just give you a rope. <laughs> uh, SDKs employ a lot of fancy things to work together. They remove uh, authentication, they add stateful uh, manage, state management to your, to your application and so on. But you will really see is that developers are trying to achieve something different. 
their end goal is not to deal with the interfaces. Their end goal is to build something that would be meaningful to the end user. And they just need to go through those interfaces in order to make it work. So what I wanna say is, and that's the main key takeaway here, developers need flexibility, and they really deserve great APIs. Thank you. Thank you, Alexander. Thank you. One question. Get time for one question. No questions. No questions. Ah, one question. Hi. Hi. Can you tell me a little bit how you do testing in an environment which is probably very hard to replicate on anyone's laptop? Yes, very hard to replicate, in fact, for sure. Um, well, the great thing about Lambdas is it's basically an environment that you can choose. So if you go for a Node.js, you can have like a local environment running for this and then replicate API calls locally on your machine. But the end-to-end -end testing is a bit more complex. And uh, given the early stage that we are in, it's important for us to test, but we rather test at the end as opposed to testing every single stage individually. Um, I think there's a lot to be figured out there. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Anybody else? Few more seconds. No. Oh, one more question. The white code auth auth two. Authorization code flow. <laughs> oh, the code. It was just the chef's code that we had over there. Of course. I thought it would be cool so people wake <laughs> up. <laughs> so, thanks again. Thank you very much, guys. <laughs>